Hi there, I'm Don McGarvey, the pastor of the Troy Mills Christian Church in Troy Mills, Iowa. We're delighted to have you join us today. We're going to go into one of our recent Sunday morning services for the teaching time. And our prayer is for you as you listen, as you read God's Word, and as you study what He has to say to you, that the Word of God will change your life and press you and conform you into the very image of Jesus Christ. Thanks again for being with us, and our prayer is that the Lord bless you greatly as you listen to this teaching. Today, though, I'm going to tell the story of, it's kind of a tucked away story in the middle, in 2 Kings. And I'm going to tell it like a traditional fairy tale, only it's not a fairy tale. So, once upon a time, in the land of Israel, there lived a man of God. His name was Elisha. And he could hear from God. God spoke to him about many things. One day, the king of Aram, who was an enemy of Israel, he decided to send his troops in and set up an ambush against the people of Israel. But God told Elisha about this ambush, told him exactly where it would be. And so Elisha went to the king of Israel, and he said, this is what's going to happen and you have to be ready. The king of Israel trusted Elisha, and so he went and he told, and they, they had um, troops in place, and the ambush never happened. This happened many times. The king of Aram was getting very upset about this. He was thinking maybe there was a traitor in, the, in his camp amongst his advisors. And he said, who amongst you is telling the king of Israel what's going to happen before it happens? And one of the officers said, no, it's none of us, king. It's that man of God that they have. Elisha can hear from God, and he tells the king of Israel what's going to happen. In fact, God even tells Elisha what the stories that you tell in your bedroom. And so the king says, okay, where is this man of God? We'll take care of him. So they said he's in Dothan. That's a city near Samaria. Samaria is the capital of Israel at that time. And so the king of Aram, the enemy, says, I'm going to send troops after the man of God will take care of him. So at night, he sent lots and lots of troops, horses and chariots, to surround the city of Dothan to capture Elisha. Well, that morning, Elisha's servant gets up and he looks outside and he sees the hills are surrounded with the troops from the king of Aram. And he's very afraid. He said, uh-oh, we're in trouble now, Elisha. What are we going to do? And Elisha looks out and he says, don't worry. There's much more for us than against us. And so Elisha prays, God, open his eyes, referring to his servant. And God opens the eyes, spiritual eyes, of Elisha's servant. And he sees that the hills are not surrounded by enemies. The hills are filled with the chariots of fire of God, and that there's angels willing to do battle in place and to, and to uh, protect those that Elisha and the, and the people around him in Dothan. So Elisha goes out and he says, God, blind the eyes of the enemy. And so he does. And he walks out to the troops, the Aramite troops, and he says, this isn't the right city. You have the wrong place. Let me lead you where you want to go. And so they follow him, blinded. They follow him, and he leads them right into the capital city of Samaria, right into the middle of the king of Israel's capital city. And he said, okay, God, open their eyes. And they see where they are. And they see that they are in the midst, surrounded by their enemies. And the king of Israel says, this is great. Thanks for bringing them in. You want me to kill them? <laughs> Elisha goes, no, you're not going to kill them. These are prisoners of war. Instead, you should feed them. So he throws a feast. The king of Israel throws a feast for his enemies. He feeds them, and then he sends them back home. And nevermore does the king of Aram send any troops out after those in Israel. So let's hear the rest of the story. One of the things that was uh, grounded into my thinking uh, about the Old Testament was is that very often, uh, the Old Testament becomes a visual aid for the New Testament. 
okay? And this story is one of the great examples of how God helps. I want you to look in your Bibles with me. We're going to look at several scriptures, and we'll come back into 2 Kings 6 in just a little bit. But I want you to look into the, your Bible into Hebrews chapter 13, okay? Look into Hebrews chapter 13, and, and we're going to read this together. I want you to, to see these things because they're very, um, in my mind, they're very important for us to know. And they're very important for us to uh, remind one another about from time to time. I need to be reminded from time to time of God's faithfulness. You need to be reminded, excuse me, you need to be reminded from time to time of God's faithfulness. Because what happens is, is that, and you've heard me say, life comes at us hard and fast a lot of times, throws us a curveball or two every once in a while, and we get caught off guard. Stuff happens. And we need to remind each other that we're not in this alone, that God is with us, that God hasn't deserted us. Uh, and, and, and I have friends that I don't get it, but every time anything of any difficulty ever happens, the first things out of their mouth is, where's God? And my response always is that God's in the same place he's always been. He's right beside you. He's right with you. He's never left you. You know, those are things that if you've gone to church, you've heard those things before, over and over and over. But we wrestle with that. Where's God? Why did this happen to me? Why did God do this to me? Number one, he didn't do it. Number two, it happens because we live in a sinful world. You know, I don't have to work hard at all to prove that to you. And with sin comes disease, with sin comes death, with sin comes depression, with sin comes discouragement, with sin comes hard times. And once in a while we need to be reminded, God's with you. He didn't leave you. You're not the only person on the earth that he's ticked at right now and he's going to get you back for all those things you did. That's not the nature of God. That's not the nature of God. So in Hebrews chapter 13, in verse 6, is this great statement about God. And, and we need, man, tattoo this on the inside of your eyelids. Okay? And here's what it says, is the Lord is my helper. Say that with me. The Lord is my helper. Say, my helper. My. Mine. He's my helper. You know, I'm really good at telling him he's your helper, or telling people he's your helper. I'm really good at saying God can do this, but when stuff starts happening to me, sometimes it's a bit of a challenge to say he's my helper. He's my helper. And then the rest of that verse says that I will not fear. Say that, I will not fear. Okay, so what can man do to me? Because God is greater. And so this story out of 2 Kings chapter 6, in my mind, is a great visual aid. Because it's one thing for me to say, the Lord is my helper. But I'm going to come back, the, the logical response to that is, well, how's he going to help me? What's he going to do? Where's he at? I can't see him. I can't feel him. How is God my helper? And so what we have is that we have this story of Elisha, this great man of God, who wrestled some of his own stuff from time to time. But Elisha, this man of God, gives us a picture of how it is that God helps us, okay? So now I want you to turn back with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. It's in the Old Testament. If you have a, a Bible like this one, it's on page 628, or um, 600, 428, 428. I don't know where it's at in the hardbound. And if you've got your own Bible with you this morning, I figure you know it well enough to find it, okay? So in 2 Kings chapter 6, and we're going to read uh, a few verses here. We're going to start off in, uh, in, in verse uh, 8, okay? Verse 8, now Chris talked about this enemy of Israel as being the king of Aram, 
A lot of countries had different names. They were the same country. They were called Aram. In, in, what we're, in the translation we're going to read today, he's called the King of Syria. Okay? So that's the same country. So don't worry about Aram and Syria. They're the same people. All right? They're both, they were enemies of God. They were enemies of God's people. So in verse 8 of 2 Kings chapter 6, Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent uh, to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. And then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. And thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice, actually many times, okay? And therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and he said to them, to them, Will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? Which one of you guys are being a traitor? In verse 12, and one of his servants says, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Now that's not an explicit form of language. That's a idiom in the Hebrew language that says the things in your bedroom are the very personal things that are, everything that you utter is told to Elisha the prophet. So there's another passage and it's on your, your, uh, your note page there that I, I, I want to make you aware of because this is another way of how God helps us. Now in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3 very powerful passage of Scripture. Jeremy, it's easy to remember, 33-3. All right? You just got to remember three threes. And, and, and it's a fascinating. I, I, know, um, I know several people that have really taken this passage to heart. And it is, I've taken this passage to heart sometimes. And I've kind of said, okay, God, I need to know something here that I don't know. And so the promise in Jeremiah 33, 3, I pray this back to God once in a while, actually quite often, because the older I get, the more I find out that I don't know very much. I don't know if any of you have experienced that or not. I, uh, I, and when I was in my late 40s, I began to experience this thing of been dealing with issues that I had no idea what I was doing. And I remember saying to somebody that by the time I was 50, I fully expected to be a bumbling idiot. And I don't know if I was very far away from that, to be honest with you. But I learned, I learned from one of my master, master commission students, I learned this passage, and we prayed it over ourselves and over one another. And, and here's what it was. It said, call to me, God's talking. He says, call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. I love that. Jeremiah 33, 3. He says, call to me. Ask me. Ask me to tell you what you need to know. And he says, and I'll tell you things that you don't know. I'll reveal the deep things of God. And when Elisha called out to God, God began to tell him the plans of the, the Aramites, the Syrians. He began to tell them, they're going to go here, so don't you go there. Or if you go there, you, be, you set up an ambush and you, you turn the tables on them. And he says, call to me and I will tell you the things that you do not know. And later on in the New Testament, what happens is, is that God gives his spirit his Holy Spirit, that when you accept Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you. And when you accept Christ and the Holy Spirit comes within you, you have the deepest, most intimate thoughts of God dwelling in you. And one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is that he is to become our teacher. He is to become our guide into all truth. He's to show us what not to do, but then to also show us what it is that he wants us to do. He's going to show us things that we don't know. He's going to tell us things that we don't know. Now, I used to tell my boys, and, and uh, they believed it, and I believed it, or I wouldn't have lied to them. I didn't lie to them. I wouldn't have told them this time. I used to tell them, I said, guys, God will tell me what you're doing if I need to know. 
God will tell me if you're lying to me or not if I need to know. I just believed that about God. I believed and I put my trust in God. I said, God, you will show me the things that I, I don't know, but I need to know them for their protection or my own protection. I need to know them. And so, God, I'm trusting you to tell me what you know, what I need to know. And matter of fact, there were times that I'd deal with my boys. There were times, that, and especially my boys, and one of them would start to say, well, Dad, how did you know that? And he said, never mind. Can I tell him? I said, God's going to tell me. I was in counseling situations. I was dealing with other people in different circumstances. And, and God began to tell me things that I didn't know about them, but that he wanted them to know that he was concerned about them, and so he would tell me those things. I scared the daylights out of somebody one time because I was talking to them about God and about their life, and I began to, to just kind of read through their whole life. I don't know how I knew. It's just in my knower. God put it in my knower. And they said, you're spooky. And I said, am I right? Yeah, but you're really spooky. And I said, can I tell you what just happened? He said, please. And he's looking around. He was kind of being funny. He says, there's no crystal ball or anything? I said, no. I said, but there is a God who's crazy about you and wants to get your attention. And so we have this God who wants to help us. And one of the ways that he will help us is that, that he will... will um, Tell us the things that we need to know. Uh, in, uh, let's keep reading. Go back to 2 Kings 6. And let's start reading again in verse 13. So somebody had identified Elisha as the one who knew all these things because his God told him. And so the reaction of the king of Syria was, verse 13, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. And therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant, uh, when, when the servant uh, of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots, and his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what are we going to do? And so Elisha says to his servant, Don't be, af don't be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I love that statement. Now, last week in our Bible reading, we read from Psalm 46, verse 11. It's on your study sheet. Don't turn there. We don't have the time to do that right now. Psalm 46, 11 says that the God of hosts is always with me. Remember who the God of hosts is? He's the captain of the armies of heaven. Okay. Remember the story we told when Joshua went to Jericho and on the way to Jericho, he got stopped. Who was it that stopped him? It was the, ha the, the Lord of hosts. It was the captain of the armies of heaven. And when Joshua, and I love this part, when Joshua says to him, are you on my side or are you on their side? And the Lord of hosts, God, says, I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. And so the big question wasn't what, whose side was he on. The big question was whether or not I'm going to be on his side or not. Okay? The big question this morning is not whose side is God on. That's already determined. The big question that's not determined is am I going to be on his side or not? Am I going to be with him or am I going to be against him? Now, we don't think in terms of that. You don't like that kind of thinking. But I'm going to tell you right now, you're loving God or you're hating God. You're walking with God or you're walking against him. There's really no in-between. There's no gray area. There's no riding the fence. When I was a kid, I hear him talking about trying to ride the fence. You want one foot in the kingdom of God, you want one foot into the world. And that, that doesn't exist. You can't do that. You can't live that way. It's an all-in or it's a nothing. And so God comes to... Elisha, and he, and, and he says, uh, I'm, I'm on your side, I'm at work. Matter of fact, another passage that's on your study sheet is that Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10 says that God will strengthen us. 
He will give us strength when we don't know what to do, when there's times that are weak. I don't know, have you ever been weak and you just didn't know what to do? You couldn't function, maybe physically, maybe emotionally, mentally. Maybe there's just nothing you could do in circumstances that happen. Uh, we had a, some of the things like that happen a, a, a few weeks ago. Some of you know the story about our son on, and the circumstances that happened on their honeymoon. And I got this call from Italy at 6.15 in the morning, Dad! And it's like, oh my goodness. We're thousands of miles away. We can't do anything. I don't know anybody, well, I, I do, but I don't know anybody in Italy that could have helped him at that point in time. And so we prayed. We asked the God who was in Hiawatha and in Rome uh, to be there and to intervene and to take care of things and to take care of our kids and, and to divinely deliver them from these circumstances. And you know what? He did. He did. The God who is the Lord of hosts, the commander of the armies of heaven, was at work. And he could do immeasurably more than what I could do. Because I didn't know what to do. And I had to pray and I had to say, God, I don't know what to do, but you know what to do. And so I'm asking for divine intervention on behalf of Sean and Ellie. I'm asking for you to work on their behalf today and to open doors, to close doors, make the way straight for you to work and to bring about the things that you desire for their lives today. And that's the way it works. And it's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week thing, and I don't have to, to, to worry. Now, I want to show you how God was going to help them. Look back in 2 Kings 6 with me, and let's read in verse 17 and 18. I love this. In 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open the eyes that he may see. A servant. Remember the servant came out and he says, oh, I see this army, we're in trouble. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now God opened the eyes of the servant. This is cool. Watch what happens then in verse 18. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike these people, I pray, with blindness. And so God opened the eyes of the servant, but he closed the eyes of the enemy. They couldn't function. But when the servant looked up, now hang on, hang on to your seats because I'm really going to blow you away here in just a minute, all right? When the servant looked up and he saw on top of the mountains, now he looked up and the mountains were full of Syrians, okay? And their chariots, and their marksmen, and their sharpshooters, and all these kinds of things that were ready to take off Elisha's head. But above the Syrians, the clouds parted, and the servant saw the armies of heaven. He saw the commander of the armies, the Lord of hosts. He saw all of heaven and the armies there ready to go and ready to do war on their behalf because that armies of heaven was greater than the armies of the Syrians. Now, here's the part that may really mess with you. That's the picture that we would see today if we could see into that realm. There's a realm that you and I can't see. There's a realm that God exists in. There are angels. There are demons. There are beings that are intent on destroying you. But the army that's greater is the army of God that is intent on delivering you and saving you. People ask me all the time, do I believe in angels? Absolutely. They ask me about these pictures in the Old Testament. Do I believe that those armies? Absolutely, I believe that. And do I believe that, it, that if somehow or some way that you and I could have our eyes opened like that servant of Elisha did and we could see into the heavens that, that we would see this army that's ready to do battle on our behalf. On our behalf. To bring about the goodness of God. 
to bring about the plans of God in your life and in my life, to bring about the deliverance from our enemies. And we need to hang on to that. So when we say, how does God help? Well, God has the armies of heaven ready at, on alert, ready to go on your behalf. Well, how do we get them going? Well, sometimes we just say, God, help. Sometimes we say, God, I need to know stuff that I don't know anything about, but in order to do this job, I got to know something and I need you to tell me. And we put our trust in him. And we know that he's greater than any being that's ever crawled out of hell. He's greater than any disease. He's greater than any circumstances, any, any financial issues, any disease, any, any, any relational issues. He is greater than any of those things and can bring about righteousness in unrighteous situations. And we've got to hang on to that. I want to end our time today a little bit different uh, than what we normally do. And I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to uh, Romans chapter 8. I want you to go to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to read the last couple of verses together uh, uh, as we leave from this place today. In Romans uh, chapter 8, In verses, uh, we'll start in 38, we'll read 38, 39, and 40. I want you to stand with me, please. This will be our dismissal. I want you to see these words. I want you to hear these words. And in essence, we're reading them to ourselves, but we're also reading them to one another this morning to remind us that there's not one thing that's ever going to happen to you or me that will ever separate us from God. There's not an enemy. There's not an army. There's not a disease. There's nothing that can happen that will separate us from the love of God because the captain of the Lord of hosts is standing at the ready with his army to intervene on your behalf today. And I want you to take that. You know, we used to say, well, you can take that to the bank. I want you to take that to the bank. You just deposit it, and you know it. You deposit it in your heart. And I want you to read with me out loud, and then we'll, we'll pray before we go. So in verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can separate you from God? Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we stand on that promise. And so, Father, I ask now in the name of Jesus that as we leave from this place, that we leave in victory. We don't leave in fear. We don't leave in doubt. But that, God, our trust is in you. That you are the faithful God. You are the commander of the host of heaven. And that you are with us. And that you are greater than anything that we're going to ever encounter. Anything that's from outer space or under the earth, you are greater. Any greater than any disease, any circumstances. And any other created being, you are greater than. And so we thank you for that, God, and we give you praise. And may we rest in that. May we go from this place today in the joy and the victory that is ours through Christ Jesus. Thanks again for joining us for this teaching of God's now. Word. In the name of if you're Jesus. ever in eastern Iowa, Amen. anywhere Amen. close God to Troy you. Mills, Iowa, you're welcome to join us every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock right here in the sanctuary. I promise you there will be a seat just for you. Thank you again for joining us, and may the Lord richly bless you as you continue to follow after Him. God bless.